global optimization and networks. We started this about three years ago now, 2020, um, and really motivated by the an idea that we want to bring together people who are working broadly in autonomous and connected systems into a into an organization that spans multiple departments, multiple colleges, really across Purdue. Um, and so this allows us to host people like you and, and find out about some of the exciting new work that's happening in this space. So yeah, thanks very much to Junji and, and Zaren for organizing the seminar series this semester, and I'll turn it back over to Junji. All right. Yes, yeah, so thanks, uh, Shreyas, for the, for the intro introduction. I guess uh, I can start with the introduction of the speaker. Um, so uh, Dilip uh, Kalasi is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at Texas A&M University. Uh, his main research area is reinforcement learning theory and algorithms and their applications in communication network and power systems. So before joining Tamu, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the EECS department at UC Berkeley. He received his PhD from the University of Southern California in 2014, where he won the best PhD dissertation prize in the Department of Electrical Engineering. He received his um, master's degree from IIT Madras, where he won the award for best academic performance in the Electrical Engineering department. He received the NSF uh, CR2 award in the year of uh, 2019 and the NSF uh, career award in the year of uh, 2021. He is uh, also a senior member of uh, H4E. Well, Dilip, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chun Chi, and um, thank you, um, uh, Shreyas, uh, Vijay, and everybody for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, in the ICON seminar, it's uh, really an honor to present my work in front of this wonderful audience. I did went through the ICON webpage and uh, the visions and uh, the things that you are doing. It's pretty amazing and uh, many familiar faces and some free places I also don't know. Hope to interact with all of you as a part of this presentation and also later during our meetings on Tuesday. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, reinforcement learning with robustness and safety guarantee. Um, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with reinforcement learning at some level. Uh, some of you may be doing your active research on reinforcement learning, in reinforcement learning theory, algorithms, or its application of reinforcement learning into your specific problems of interest. Reinforcement learning is a class of machine learning focusing on how to learn the optimal sequence of action in an unknown environment uh, and evolving environment in order to maximize the cumulative long-term reward. So this is the canonical diagram that we typically use to represent the reinforcement learning paradigm. A learning algorithm interacts with an environment by taking a sequence of action. The learning algorithm gets the sequence of observations and the reward. And the goal of the learning algorithm is to take the actions in order to maximize the cumulative long-term reward. As an example, consider the problem of learning to play that Atari game. The actions can come from the uh, joystick. The environment is that Atari game engine. The observations are the screen image and the rewards are actual points of the games. In another example, the actions can come from the steering wheel to the environment of an autonomous vehicle and the observations can be the camera or LiDAR images. Reinforcement learning had some shining successes in the past few years. In 2015, DeepMind published this impressive work of a deep RL algorithm uh, that was able to outperform human expert in playing at Atari game. This was followed by a series of work um, from uh, DeepMind, um, uh, the AlphaGo algorithm and its variants. And these algorithms were able to outperform human agents, actually human expert, uh, uh, in playing much more complicated games such as Go, Chess, and Shogi. RL also had some interesting successes in robotics. For example, this work from OpenAI attracted much press coverage at that time. They used an RL algorithm for solving a robotic hand, so for a robotic hand to solve Rubik's cube problem. RL also had some very interesting recent successes such as chip placement design and in recommendation systems. But if you carefully read the success stories, you will immediately realize that most of these RL success stories are limited to very structured or simulated environments, such as games or simple robotics ethics. So the success stories of RL in real-world engineering systems are rather rare or rather limited. So what is holding up reinforcement learning from emerging as the go-to solution for the control of real-world engineering systems? 
So I believe that that is the main reason is the fragility of reinforcement learning algorithm in the sense that this algorithm lacks robustness and safety guarantee. So anyone who has trained an R algorithm must be familiar with scenarios like this. So here a hopper in a Mojoko environment is failing repeatedly during training and sometimes even during testing. So it is natural to think that scenarios happening in the real world. For example, a robot controlled by your RL algorithm is falling down during the execution of a task. In fact, if you read the fine print, you will realize that this work which attracted much press coverage at that time was successful only 32% of the time. Uh, obviously, namely using any machine learning or reinforcement learning algorithm that lacks robustness or safety guarantee can lead to catastrophic failures in the real world engineering system as seen by a series of bad examples recently. So in this context, this is a fundamental question that I asked in the part of my research. How do we develop scalable reinforcement learning algorithms that are provably safe? In fact, this is one of the fundamental questions that is at the core of my research effort for the past couple of years. And today I'm going to present some of the recent work from my group um, on addressing this question from multiple perspectives. Uh, I'll pause here and then uh, just, uh, is there any echo? Um, uh, you're able to hear me clearly? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so first I will talk about robust reinforcement learning. Uh, in, we have a series of work on the topic of robust reinforcement learning from our group. In today's talk, I will focus on this particular work, uh, which was published in Neurips uh, two months back. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, my PhD student, Kishan and Zayan. Kishan is a lead author in the series of work. And for this particular work, we also had a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with uh, Dr. Muhammad Gawam Sadi from Google Research. Before I start discussing on my robust reinforcement learning algorithm, let's ask ourselves, why do we need robust reinforcement learning? The main reason is simulation to reality, yeah. So reinforcement learning algorithm typically learn a policy by training on a simulator. However, the real world system parameters can be different from that of the simulator. For example, in robotics, the mass, the friction, sensor noise, action delays, etc., can be different between the real world system and the simulator, which is trying to approximate the real world systems. And it is known both in theory and practice that Reinforcement learning algorithm trained on a simulator may perform poorly in the real world system due to this simulation to reality gap. And this is not a hypothetical question. This is a very important question that is being actively addressed both by the academia as well as industry. You will find a number of publications, workshops, and uh, seminars on the topic of the simulation to reality gap, as well as significant effort from industry, such as the one, uh, the recent work from NVIDIA here on overcoming the simulation to reality gap. In fact, simulation to reality gap is arguably one of the most important challenges that we need to overcome to make our algorithm deployable in the real world engineering system. So in this context, I address the following question. How do we develop scalable reinforcement learning algorithm that are provably robust against parameter mismatches between the simulated model and the real world model? So our standard in reinforcement learning, I use the framework of Markov decision processes to mathematically formulate this problem. I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with the, the notion of MTP also in some, some fashion. So I'll be very brief here, not to bore you with the other technical uh, notations. So in an MTP, we have a state space, an action space, uh, a probability transition function. So P of S prime given S comma A, represent the probability of moving from state S to S prime if action A is taken. So this P is also called the model of the system. So for the rest of my talk, I will use the keyword model instead of the probability transition function. There is a reward associated with each state action pair and a policy is a mapping from the state space to the probability distribution over the action space. The MTP is a very general and a very useful formalism that can capture most of the real world control problems of interest. For example, in this robotic control problem, the position of the robot can be thought as the state of the system. The torque or forces that we are applying to move the robot can be thought as the actions. The reward can depend on the position or the gait of the robot. At any given time t, a control policy phi select the action at depending on the current state st and the next state st plus one will be realized according to the model of the system. 
the value of a policy is the expected cumulative discounted reward that we can get by following the policy. And the optimal value function is the maximum value a policy can achieve. And the optimal policy is the policy which achieves the maximum value. And the MTP objective is the following. How do we find the optimal policy when the model is known? And we know that dynamic programming provides an answer to this question, that is, value iteration or policy iteration algorithm can be used for finding the optimal policy. Reinforcement learning is the learning version of the MTP problem. The goal here is to learn the optimal policy when the model is unknown. In this part of the talk, I'll mainly focus on the offline reinforcement learning problem and offline robust reinforcement learning problem. Here also goal is the same. How do we learn the optimal policy when the model is unknown, but using only historical offline data without having access to the direct interaction with the environment or with a sophisticated simulator model? So offline RL is a very useful paradigm in a large number of systems, such as autonomous vehicle recommendation system, power system, clinical treatment, et cetera. But it is typically easy to get historical data, but it is very difficult to model the whole system. And it is even exp typically expensive or even unsafe to have sequential interaction with the real world engineering system. For example, in power, power system, it, you may be able to get the operational offline data, the behavioral data, but definitely not advisable to have direct interaction with the power system for the purpose of learning the optimal control policy. And whenever we say learn in the context of machine learning, we typically assume that there is some data to learn from. So what is the data assumption in offline reinforcement learning? So just like men I mentioned here, we assume that the algorithm has access to your data generated according to a behavioral policy from a nominal model. So we use the script D to, notate, uh, to denote the offline data. So offline data is of, the, is of the form of the tuples, state, action, reward, and the next state. And the next state is sampled according to the model. Most offline RL algorithm learn the optimal policy by explicitly or implicitly learning about the model from the offline data. But what if the model is wrong? In our particular context, what if the real world model P is different from the nominal model which generated the data? As I mentioned before, the simulation to reality gap is one of the most important challenges that we need to overcome to make our RL algorithm deployable in the real world engineering systems. So I address this problem using the formalism of robust Markov decision process. A robust Markov decision process is similar to a standard MDP in the sense that we have the same state space, same action space, and the same reward function. But instead of considering a single model, we consider a set of models script P. So the set of model is called the uncertainty set. The script P is denoted as the Cartesian product of the uncertainty set corresponding to a given state action pair. So the uncertainty set corresponding to a given state action pair, script PSA, can be thought as a ball of radius rho around the nominal probability distribution corresponding to that particular state action pair, P naught SA. So here D can be the distance, D is the distance measure between two probability distribution, such as KL, TV, or chi square. So the robust MDP objective is the following. Given the uncertainty set, how do we find the optimal robust policy? So the optimal robust policy is the solution of this optimization problem, arc max over pi, min over all possible models in the uncertainty set, expectation of the cumulative discounted reward according to this particular model P. So intuitively, we want to find a max min policy. Another way to think about this is by defining a robust value function. So the robust value of a policy can be defined in the following way, min over P, min over all possible models in the uncertainty set, V phi P. So the robust value of a policy is the the worst value that you can get with respect to the worst model in the uncertainty set for a given policy. And the RMDP objective is to find a policy that can maximize the robust value function. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the objective in the standard MDP and the robust MDP. In the standard MDP, you are trying to find a policy that maximizes the value function. In the robust MDP, you are trying to find a policy that maximizes the robust value function. Now, offline robust RL problem or robust RL problem is the learning version of the robust MDP problem. Our goal is to learn the optimal robust policy when the uncertainty set is unknown. So as I mentioned, 
I'm going to consider the offline robust model problem. So what is the data assumption that I'm using? I'm going to use the same data assumption that we use for the non-robust reinforcement learning problem. So we assume that the learning algorithm has access to the data generated according to a behavioral policy from a nominal simulator model. So the offline data script D is of the form tuple, state, action, reward, and the next state. And the next state is generated according to the nominal model P0. So let me emphasize that this, I'm using the notation P0 to kind of emphasize that the data is generated according to the nominal model, but the real world model P can be different from the nominal model. So this immediately brings out a fundamental challenge in the robust reinforcement learning problem. If you look at this equation, in order to compute the optimal robust policy, you may have to evaluate this expectation with respect to all the possible models in the uncertainty set. But here, we have the data generated only according to the nominal model. So how do we solve this minimization problem here? And how do we find this? How do we estimate this expectation? How do we estimate this robust value, given that we have data from only from the nominal model? So clearly, obtaining samples according to each and every model in the uncertainty set is infeasible. We have to leave with the data that we have. So this is one of the many challenges that we need to overcome to find the optimal robust policy through a robust reinforcement learning approach. So before describing our algorithm, let me give a quick summary about the related work. The robust MDP formulation was first introduced and studied in detail by two seminal parallel work, one by uh, Iyengar and other by Nilim and Elgoy. And this was followed by a series of work on studying the properties of robust MDP and understanding more computationally tractable algorithm. But this series of work were mainly focusing on the planning problem, but not on the learning problem. Obviously, there are interesting works on the reinforcement learning approach to solve the robust MDP problem. But as stand, including some of the work from our group, recent works, uh, but as standard in the literature, the most of this early work were focusing on the tabular setting or linear function approximation setting that does not really scale to large state space. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, there are approaches of, there are ideas of bringing deep RL algorithm to solve the deep robust RL problem. But as standard in the literature, most of this belongs to this uh, algorithmic approaches relying on heuristics. They don't typically provide the provable performance guarantees. Uh, I acknowledge that this is only a partial list. I know that there is a other multiple aspect of solving robust reinforcement learning or robust control problem. For example, from the control community, there is a rich literature on robust and robust adaptive controls uh, in the using, for example, edge infinity ideas. I focused only on the robust MDP framework. So I kind of, I'm not listing some of that references here. So I apologize for that omission. Uh, and I'm all of this if I'm missing anything other important. So in this context, our main contribution is the following. We address the offline robust RL problem with very large state space using the functional approximation with provable guarantees on the performance of the learned policy. Um, I'll pause here for a moment and then ask you if you have any questions. Okay. Okay, so before discussing the robust reinforcement learning algorithm, let's answer ourselves, let's ask ourselves, how do we find the optimal robust policy uh, in the MDP setting, that is when the uncertainty set is known. So this can be done by robust dynamic programming. So we can actually define the robust Bellman operator similar to the standard Bellman operator. So the robust Bellman operator T operating on Q is defined the following way. T Q of S comma A is R of S comma A plus gamma times in for all possible models in the uncertainty set and an expectation of the Q value function where the next state is sampled according to that particular P. So it is, you can notice that if there is no in fear, this, is, this will immediately reduce the standard Bellman operator. But you can show that most of the useful properties of the standard Bellman operator will carry over to the robust Bellman operator. In particular, you can show that the robust Bellman operator is a contraction operator. And so it has a unique fixed point and the unique fixed point is the optimal robust Q value function. So then we can actually define a robust Q value iteration, QK plus one is equal to TQK to compute the Q star. Since T is contraction, it will converge to Q star. 
and the optimal robust policy can be computed as the argmax policy. So pi star is argmax of q star. So this essentially gives us an approach to find the optimal robust policy from a robust dynamic programming perspective when the uncertainty set is known. Our goal is to solve the robust reinforcement learning problem using offline data for RMDPs with very large state space. And we propose an algorithm called robust fitted Q iteration algorithm to solve this problem. The basic idea behind the robust fitted Q iteration algorithm is straightforward. We want to approximate the exact RQI update, QK plus one is equal to TQK with function approximation using offline data. So I want to get the next iterate QK plus one as a solution of an optimization problem uh, over the function class script F. The function class script F is the class of function that I'm using to represent the robust Q value function. Intuitively, I'm trying to find the best fit for TQK by minimizing the squared error. So while this may appear straightforward, this is particularly challenging in the robust reinforcement learning context because evaluating the robust Bellman operator with function approximation using offline data is going to be challenging. So to understand the challenges, let's recall the robust Bellman operator. So you can see that there is an in for all possible models here, and there is an expectation. Evaluating this inf itself is going to be challenging. And obviously, evaluating this expectation using the data from only nominal model is going to be challenging. And there are other some other challenges which I'm not mentioning here, but this is one of the key issues. So in our work, we propose to overcome the first challenge by a dual reformulation of the robust Bellman operator. So let me state that in the form of a proposition. So let's consider an RMDP with an uncertainty set script P. Uh, here I'm going to restrict the uncertainty set uh, use defined using a total variation distance. You can use other distances like KL or chi-square, other distance measure to define the uncertainty set. Here I'm focusing only on the total variation distance. Then the robust Bellman operator T can be equal and rewritten in the following way. So there's a lot of notations here. So let me quickly unpack that for you. There are two take takeaway messages here. The first thing to notice here is that the expectation is only with respect to the nominal model P not now. The objective is different. This objective is different from the objective of the original robust Bellman operator. But the expectation, however, is only with respect to the nominal model, not with respect to all the other possible models in the uncertainty set. So arguably, you may be able to estimate this value using the offline data generated according to the nominal model. The second thing to notice here is that the in for all possible models in the uncertainty set is now replaced by an in for the scalar variable eta. And you can show that this inner minimization problem is convex in eta. So this kind of dual reformulation technique is typically used in many Lit, uh, many works in the distributionally robust optimization literature in the static context. So we re realize that those ideas can be brought into the dynamic programming approaches and then can be used to reformulate the robust Bellman operator. But this reformulation alone will not solve our problem immediately because as you can see, there is an inner optimization problem to be solved. So let me rewrite that inner optimization problem here. So there is an expectation outside and there is an inner optimization problem. So this still requires solving an optimization problem for each state action pair, which is clearly infeasible if you have a very large state space or very, very large action space. So here also we have a very simple idea to overcome this problem. Our key idea is to reformulate this as a functional optimization problem instead of solving it as a multiple scalar optimization problem. So to do that, I defined a dual loss function L dual. So for a given Q, the loss for the function G is defined in the following way. Here also there is a lot of notation. So let me unpack that for you. Uh, so look at equation one and equation two, and you can see that this equation, the objective and this equations are indeed the same. The black font equations, the black font are indeed the same, except that eta in equation one is replaced by the function G evaluated at state S and A state S and action A at S and A. However, these equations are different because the inner optimization problem in uh, equation one, that is an element-wise inner optimization problem, that is replaced by an outer optimization over an appropriate function space. So this is easy to solve empirically because you can solve over a function class instead of 
element wise optimization. But can I solve this instead of this? Yes, you can. You can actually interchange this expectation and minimization under appropriate condition. In particular, if you ensure that this in power appropriate function class here L1, then this solution of this equation one and equation two are the same. So instead of solving the multiple scalar optimization, I can that can be replaced by a single dual variable function optimization or an appropriate function space. So I can get the dual variable function GK as the arg in for this function class by solving the dual function, dual, dual loss function for a given QK. So uh, I will, due to time constraint, I will skip over the other intuition that we used to build this, our RFQ algorithm. And I will immediate, I will kind of directly go to the, our RFQ algorithm. So our RFQ algorithm, the inputs are the following. We start with the offline data set generated according to a nominal model. We use two function class, script F and script G. Script F is the class of function that we are using to represent the robust Q value function. Script G is the class of function that we are using to represent the uh, dual variable function. Our algorithm is operating in iterate. So each iterate has two steps. The first step of each iterate is the dual variable function optimization. So our goal is to compute the dual variable function corresponding to QQ, QK, and we do that by empirical risk minimization. So this is essentially the same thing that I mentioned in the previous slide. I get the dual variable function GK by minimizing this dual loss function for a given QK over an appropriate function class script G. Earlier, I had the actual dual loss function, but that to get the actual dual loss function, I need to use the actual expectation. I don't have the actual expectation, but I can replace that actual expectation with an empirical estimate using offline data. That is definitely going to introduce some error. We show that that error can be appropriately upper bounded. So we use the empirical risk minimization approach to solve the dual variable function optimization. Now, given that we solve the dual variable function for that UK, now using this dual variable function GK, we can get the next iterate QK plus one through the least square regression. So this is similar to the original least square problem that I introduced, but in the dual form. And then I can get the next iterate QK plus one given this current QK and the up corresponding dual variable function GK. I can write the exact least square optimization problem in the following way. Uh, this equation is not important. Essentially, this is just a least square minimization problem using the offline data. Obviously, using offline data here, that will also introduce some approximation error. We show that we can bound that approximation error appropriately. Okay. And then we will continue this iterate until capital K number of steps. So pi K is the output of our algorithm, which is the arc max policy obtained from QK. Now, under some suitable assumption, we can give the performance guarantee for our, our, our RFQ algorithm. I'm not going to explain these assumptions in detail. I just want to mention that these assumptions are similar to the standard assumption that we used in non-robust offline oral literature. Uh, the first assumption is called the concentrability assumption. It's essentially in place that the offline data has satisfied some certain coverage assumption. It's a standard assumption used in non-robust offline oral literature. The appropriate completeness assumption intuitively means that the function class script F that we are using is rich enough. So the Bellman operator is closed under that function class. Again, this is a standard assumption that is being used in non-robust offline in our literature. So approximate dual realizability assumption is an additional assumption that we are using. Essentially, a natural extension of this approximate completion assumption to the dual variable function. Again, essentially, this means that the function class script G that we are going to that we are using to represent the dual variable function is rich enough. Under the standard assumption, we can give the following performance guarantee. So let me state that in the form of theorem. Let pi k be the output of our RFQ algorithm after k iteration. Then the robust value of the optimal robust value function minus the robust value of the output policy pi k can be upper bounded in the following way. So this upper bound has two terms. Let's look at the second term first. So here you can see epsilon c and epsilon dual. Those are coming from the approximate completeness assumption and approximate dual realizability assumption. So if they are small enough, this will this is negligible. 
and if capital K is large, the number of iteration of our algorithm is large, the second term is negligible. So the first term is the important term, the statistical error. And you can see that that is of the order of one over square root n and log cardinality of the function class. So, so this is a standard form that will appear in uh, offline, non-robust offline RL literature. And we are able to get a similar bound for the robust offline RL algorithm also. And then we have the horizon bound, one over one minus gamma two. So this is a standard bound that we get in the non-robust offline RL literature also. To summarize, using the similar assumption in the non-robust offline RL, we are able to generalize that result into a robust RL algorithm. Okay, now we have a theoretical guarantee, uh, but how does this algorithm work? So we did extensive evaluation in Mujoku environment. So for illustrative purpose, let me take one example, a Hopper simulation environment. And uh, in this plot, I'm going to compare two algorithm. The black curve is the RFQ algorithm, our robust algorithm. The red curve is the fitted Q iteration algorithm, the standard non-robust offline RL algorithm. Y-axis is the average cumulative reward in 20 trials. X-axis is where I'm introducing this simulation to reality gap. So by changing the parameter, joint friction loss parameter in the Hopper environment. So if the value is zero, it means that there is no simulation to reality gap. So the testing environment is identical to the training environment. And as the this parameter, as the x-axis increases, I'm introducing more and more sim to reality gap. So you can see that as the simulation to reality gap increases, then the performance of the FQ algorithm is decreasing rapidly. But our RFQ algorithm performance remains more or less the same as expected, because that is the idea of a robust RL algorithm. We did the simulations in many other environments. We also compared with the state-of-the-art policy gradient algorithm, and our algorithm performs um, superior in all the scenarios. So it's much better appreciated if I um, show the video corresponding to this. So here, I think you can see the video. The first video is essentially the performance of a TD3 algorithm, like a state-of-the-art policy gradient algorithm on a nominal model. And you can see that that is working well. The hopper is able to hope, as we expect. The second, uh, second video shows the performance of TD3 algorithm when I am introducing simulation to reality gap by changing the parameter control actuator range. As you can see that the standard uh, TD3 algorithm is failing at that scenario. The third algorithm is our algorithm in the presence of simulation to reality gap. And you can compare second video and third video and see that the third video, our algorithm is able to perform well in the presence of that simulation to reality gap. We compared that with the other standard offline RL algorithm also. For example, FQ algorithm, first video is the offline RL algorithm performance with no simulation to reality gap. Second video, when we introduce a simulation reality gap, standard offline RL algorithm is not working. And third video, our algorithm, it is robust, even in the presence of the simulation reality gap. So for fun, we actually tried this with a reduced gravity. So this is the testing performance. You can see that the first video is a FQ algorithm, is a standard offline RL algorithm. It is not able to perform in this reduced gravity environment. So second video, TD3 algorithm, it is trying to hope in this reduced gravity environment is not able to do. Uh, and the third video, our RFQ algorithm, you can see that our algorithm is able to make that hope or hope. And you can actually that moonwalking effect of that hoping in that reduced gravity. Um, due to time constraint, I will skip over this proof ideas because I want to cover a few other things. So uh, in a very short time, um, I will I'll, I would like to discuss this recent work uh, where I got this wonderful opportunity to work on a, a real world application and demonstration of a robust RL algorithm. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Professor Mobile Benedict in the Aerospace Engineering Department and uh, two students, Vishnu, who was a master's student in the EC department, and uh, Bochen was a PhD student in the aerospace engineering department. So Professor Mobile Benedict is a um, um, aerospace engineer. He builds and flies things. He builds drones and helicopters and uh, fly things. 
So he's an actual engineer, unlike me, who works mostly on the theory and algorithms. Uh, for him, unlike me again, uh, an upper bound of an algorithm is not a valid book of an algorithm, even if it matches with the lower bound. For him, an algorithm is useful if he's able to take that algorithm, deploy on his real world system, and able to make it work. So uh, around like one, one and a half years back, he told me that he's working on this problem, uh, where his goal is to develop an algorithm for an autonomous ship landing for vertical takeoff landing capable UAVs using only a monocular camera in the UAV for tracking and localization. And he told me that there are significant challenges to achieve this objective, such as the small landing space, six degrees of freedom of ship deck motion, limited visual preferences for localization, and more importantly, adverse real wind cache. So he tried some classical control algorithm like simple PAD control or a variation of an LQR algorithm, which did not really work. So at that time, I was kind of working on this robust RL algorithm, and I suggested, hey, why can't we try robust RL algorithm? And he said, OK, let's try. And that was the beginning of this project. Uh, this actually started before this RFQI paper or RFQI idea that we, I presented just now. So at that time, we considered a different robustness criteria and a different algorithmic approach. So as I mentioned before, this RMDP essentially solves a max-min problem. This maximum criteria can be conservative in some systems. So at that time, we consider like a relaxed robustness criteria, which we call soft robustness criteria. Instead of a maximum, we took a max expectation criteria by re replacing this min over all possible models by an expectation over all possible models. So this criteria also appears in robotics and RL literature in a class of algorithms called domain randomization algorithm. And the basic idea behind domain randomization is straightforward. Essentially, you just randomize the simulation model parameters during training. And the policy or the neural network which represent the policy will be exposed to a wide range of environments at the training. And the policy trained in the simulation will generalize to the real world setting with no additional fine tuning. And so this is a heuristic approach for overcoming the simulation to reality gap problem. So we discussed, to, we decided to follow this approach. And we developed a soft robust RL algorithm using simulated training. And then we tested it in the real world setting without any additional fine tuning. And the students actually built the experimental platform for this. So this is a ship deck platform. This green thing is the horizon bar where the drone is uh, tracking and local uh, tracking and use for localization. We use a big drone fan to create the pin cache. So I think the Algorithm performance will be better appreciated if I show the video of that. Uh, you are able to see the video, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is the baseline performance, no wind. Uh, so a PAD controller is able to go and track the um, I mean, track the horizon bar and land. So here you can see the effect of wind. There's a drum fan here. You can see the effect of wind. Is that, oh, my, I'm really sorry. So in the effect of the wind is kind of, the drone is not able to land properly. But when we used our robust RL algorithm, it was able to fight off that wind. Uh, not very smoothly, but it's able to fight off that wind and go and land it in that environment. Uh, so the effect is a little more dramatic in the scenario in the case of an orthogonal wind. When we have an orthogonal wind, the PAD control was not able to control the drone. It kind of got flown away. And our robust RL algorithm was able to fight off that wind gust. And was able to go and land in that spot. So uh, that was the 
wonderful experience for me uh, somebody who works mostly on the theory and algorithm side to see our algorithm being actually implemented in the real world and see the effect of robust Charles algorithm for an actual real world problem so i think i can kind of partially claim that i am also a real engineer now or maybe a partially real engineer okay so i'll pause here for a moment and if you have any other if you have any questions and i'm going to start i'm I'll, in the remaining time i'll quickly talk about my work on safe reinforcement learning uh, related to the broader theme. Any questions? Really quick question on that one. Is there any insight then on what the learned robust RL algorithm is doing differently from the nonlinear PID? What is the, you know, uh, yeah, is there some inter interpretability to the learned policy? Um, uh, and so, so unfortunately, no. Uh, uh, so because it's, uh, we did not really compare, we did not do that interpretability study. Uh, ultimately, this was represented by a neural network. Um, yeah, so. Got it. Yeah, perfect, thanks. And then the other question was in the formulation, you know, where you pointed out the min mats is conservative. Um, so it's replaced by sampling from the distribution. I guess the distribution, choice of distribution is important, um, right? In terms of making sure it's representative of the scenarios encountered in the real world. Um, and this this sampling is done through the simulator. Is that correct? So this 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 part, the uh, this particular part is sampling is completely done through the simulator. Okay. So I um, so I want to distinguish this. This is a more like a deep robust RL algorithm uh, as a mm -hmm. real world implementation. The mm -hmm. previous the the any earlier the first part that I talked about the RFQ algorithm. So there. I am not perturbing the simulators. Sampling is always done by a nominal simulator. Or in that particular case, you are given the data, the electricity, I mean, power system behavioral data. You can't change the data. You won't get any more sample by perturbing the simulator because you don't have access to the simulator or the real world system. So for me, I think uh, this is a really interesting result in the sense that you can just work with that nominal simulator model and still get the robust policy uh, using this algorithm. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thank you. So, so I want to separate that. In one case, we are not perturbing uh, the environment. We are just using the simulator data. The other case, yes, soft robustness, we are doing that approach. Okay. Um, you know, slightly, I mean, little press for time. So I'll be, to try to be quick here. So in this part, I'll describe my work on safe reinforcement learning. <laughs> Excuse me. So we actually have a series of work on the topic of safe reinforcement learning from our group. Uh, in today's uh, talk, I'll focus mainly on this recent work, which was presented in Europe two months back. And for this multiple papers, I got this wonderful opportunity to collaborate with a uh, number of really bright PhD students and my uh, esteemed colleagues here, Archana, Arya, Ruida, Tawa, and Sapna are the PhD students in the department. And I also collaborate with Srinivas, JF, Professor Kumar, and uh, Chavoti and the department. They are, the, uh, they are my colleagues. Okay, so just like I asked uh, myself, or we asked ourselves, why do we need a robust reinforcement learning? I start with the same question. Why do we need safe reinforcement learning? But I think here, probably the yeah, the answer may be a little more intuitive in the sense that the control policy for any real world system should maintain some necessary safety criteria to avoid undesirable outcome. We want to avoid collisions in autonomous vehicles. We want the we want to avoid the robots falling down. We want to avoid blackouts in power systems. But reinforcement learning algorithm may violate the necessary safety constraints during learning and during deployment. And the safety constraint violation may lead to catastrophic outcome in the real-world engineering systems. So how do we develop reinforcement learning algorithm that find the optimal policy without violating the safety constraints during learning and during deployment? So just like I used RMDP formalism to address this problem a little uh, formally, mathematically, I'm going to use the constraint marker decision for um, constraint marker decision formalism to address a safe reinforcement learning problem. The CMDP formalism is a standard approach uh, in many of the recent work to model and address the safe reinforcement learning problem where the safety requirements are typically modeled as constraints on cumulative cost. 
So we, I'm going to consider a finite horizon CMDP, uh, state space S, action space A, model P, H is the horizon. Now, different from the standard MDP, a CMDP has a two reward or cost function. We have an objective reward function R and a constraint cost function C and a safety constraint C bar. So the value of a policy for any reward or cost function can be defined in the following way. This is nothing but the expected cumulative reward or expected cumulative uh, cost. And different from the standard MDP, a CMDP has two value function, an objective value function with respect to the objective reward function R and a constraint value function with respect to the constraint cost function C. And the CMDP problem is the following. You want to find the optimal safe policy pi star by solving this constraint optimization problem. So intuitively, we want to maximize the objective value function such that the constraint value function is less than or equal to C bar. Safe reinforcement learning is the learning version of the constraint MDP problem. So we also call this constraint reinforcement learning. So our goal is to learn the optimal safe policy when the model is unknown, but without violating the safety constraints during learning. So I want to ensure that I want to learn the optimal safe policy, but I don't want to violate the safety constraint during learning that optimal safe policy. To model this uh, clearly, I am going to consider an episodic online learning framework. So uh, my algorithm is operating in multiple learning episodes. So in each learning episode, the algorithm is selecting a policy pi k, a learning pol policy pi k. And this pi k is used to collect the data from that episode. So state action reward and the next states are the data. So you collect a trajectory of data and the algorithm takes this trajectory of data to update the policy for the next episode. And this repeats. And the goal is that, or the intuition is that this learning episode as increases, as k, k increases, you will convert to the safe policy or the optimal policy. Okay. But we want to do in the following way that we want to ensure that the policy selected by the algorithm at each learning episode should satisfy the safety constraint. So the constraint, the, the constraint value function for the policy pi k should be less than or equal to c bar for all k. Now, this is very closely connected with the exploration and the exploitation problem in multi ambanded and reinforcement learning. But the, with the difference that here we want to do exploration without violating the safety constraint in the exploration. So to characterize that, I'm going to define two notions of regret. The first is called the objective regret. This is very similar to the standard regret, excuse me. The objective regret is very similar to the standard regret. Uh, if you look at inside the summation, this is the uh, difference between the uh, objective value corresponding to the optimal safe policy and the objective value corresponding to the uh, learning policy. Constraint regret is nothing but the cumulative constraint violation. Now, our goal is in the safe reinforcement learning is to develop a learning algorithm which will minimize the objective regret while keeping the constraint regret to zero. Now, um, let me very quickly summarize the related work in this domain. So exploration or safe learning and constraint bandits has been studied uh, in many recent work. Uh, the, the extension or generalization of safe reinforcement learning in constraint bandit into reinforcement learning is also has also been addressed in uh, many works. So I would like to separate this class of work into two categories. There are a number of works, including some works from our group, on addressing the safe exploration problem in RL with constraint violation. So the goal is to learn the safe policy, but you allow the constraints to be violated. You are, you are violating that, you violate the constraints during learning. The goal is to characterize, uh, or the goal is to come up with an algorithm that will minimize the total constraint violation. So this class of work essentially give an upper bound on the objective regret and the constraint regret. My work belongs to the second category. I want to learn the optimal safe policy, but without violating the safety constraint. That is ensuring that the constraint violation uh, regret is zero. So here also safe reinforcement learning is a broad area. There are multiple approaches to address the safety in reinforcement learning. I'm focusing only on the class of work which use the CMDP as the basic formalization and essentially bringing the exploration during learning. So that's why I'm rushing to this class of work. Again, apologies if I'm missing anything important. Okay, 
So classical regret minimization algorithm in bandits and multi reinforcement learning essentially follow this standard idea of optimism in the face of uncertainty. So the first thing that we did, of course, is to see whether an optimism in the face of uncertainty approach is able to solve the safe reinforcement learning problem. So what is optimism in the face of uncertainty? That is an episodic model-based uh, exploration algorithm. So in the beginning of each episode, we construct an estimate of the model P hat K. Then we construct an uncertainty set around this estimated model P hat K. Here, beta is the radius of the uncertainty set. So beta is of the form square root of one, one square root of square root of one over n k of SA. n k of SA is the number of times the state action pair SA is visited by the algorithm until the episode K. Uh, the exact form of the radius of the uncertainty set is not important because this is just to apply the appropriate bunch and inequality. Roughly the order is uh, one over square root of NK of SA. Now, given this uncertainty set, we solve the OFU problem. The standard OFU algorithm solve this following problem. So the basic idea is that we first find an optimistic model from the uncertainty set and corresponding the optimal policy with respect to that optimistic model. So here PK is the optimistic model from the uncertainty set and Pi K is the optimal policy for that optimistic model. And then this optimistic policy is used to for used for exploration in episode K. And then this is repeated. And uh, typically in bandits and reinforcement learning algorithm, this is a provably optimal approach for finding the uh, optimal policy by minimizing the regression. Now, our first question is, can this approach work for learning the safe reinforcement in the safe reinforcement learning context? Okay. But unfortunately, you know, uh, in a way it is intuitive. If you are being optimistic, it is very likely that you will violate the safety constraints during learning. Okay. And in fact, this is not a heuristic, uh, heuristic idea. A previous work showed that if you use a name or a few style algorithm, you will get the objective regret of the order of square root k, which is good because that is the optimal order of the regret. But the constraint regret is also of the order of k, which is bad because it essentially means that you are keep on violating the safety constraints during learning. The cumulative safety constraint violation is increasing with the number of learning episodes. So our goal is the following. Can we get the same optimal objective regret, order of square root k objective regret, while achieving the zero constraint regret? And we propose an algorithm called doubly optimistic and pessimistic exploration algorithm to solve this problem. So we first tried OFU, and it is not it is not uh, able to do safe reinforcement learning. So we asked ourselves, why is it not able to do safe reinforcement learning? Why is it violating the constraint? Again, in the hindsight, the solution, the, the answer is obvious because it is optimistic. It is optimistic both with respect to the objective and also with respect to the constraint. And if your algorithm is optimistic with respect to the constraint, then that may lead to constraint violation. So then we have a simple idea to overcome this issue. We thought that, oh, let's be pessimistic with respect to the constraint. Let's avoid constraint violation by being pessimistic. So we proposed to do this pessimistic exploration by defining a pessimistic cost function C bar. So the pessimistic cost function C bar is defined as C, the standard cost function, plus a pessimism term. And the pessimism term is proportional to the radius of the uncertainty set. And then if you use this pessimistic cost function in the standard OFP approach, will it work? It will work and it will not work, two answers. It will work in the sense that this will ensure that there is no constraint violation. But at the same time, it will not work because it is not able to achieve a reasonable objective regret, meaning this is very, very pessimistic. It is not doing enough exploration to minimize the objective regret. Then we thought, okay, it is not doing enough exploration. So how do we bring more exploration? Then we thought that, hey, we can induce more exploration using an optimistic idea. We already have an optimism in with respect to the model. So why can't we optimistic with respect to the objective? So we, for that, we define an optimistic reward function, R bar, the standard reward function, plus an optimism term, which is again proportional to the radius of the uncertainty set with appropriate constant. And then we put together, and that is our doubly optimistic, pessimistic exploration algorithm. So this algorithm looks similar to OFU algorithm, optimism in the face of uncertainty algorithm, 
with the following difference. Instead of considering a standard reward function, we consider an optimistic reward function. Instead of considering a standard cost function, we consider a pessimistic cost function. And then we have the standard optimism with respect to the model here. So we have two optimism term, an optimism with respect to the reward, an optimism with respect to the model. And we have one pessimistic term, an pessimism with respect to the cost. And then we perform this operation and the pi k used in the learning episode k. This is our doubly optimistic, pessimistic uh, exploration algorithm. We kind of named it cheekily because there is a double optimism and a pessimistic exploration, so dope. So uh, one thing I would like to mention that intuitively it is not possible to guarantee safety in the beginning of learning if you do not know anything about the model, that is obvious. So one standard assumption used in the literature is that in the beginning, you start with a safe baseline policy. That policy need not be optimal. It may be far away from the optimal. But to start with, you have a safe baseline policy. So we make the same assumption. We assume that the algorithm has access to a safe baseline policy and uh, that constraint cost, uh, constraint value function for that safe baseline policy with C bar V that is less than C bar, the, the maximum uh, constraint violation that you can afford. Okay? So our algorithm is in the following way. For the first k naught learning episode, our algorithm will use the safe baseline policy. And after that, we will use the DOP policy. This k naught is a constant in the sense that that does not depend on the maximum number of episode capital K. And then, so, so this, this part essentially introduce only a constant regret. We can put this together and then some complicated analysis and then we can get this result. So informally, this is the performance guarantee for our DOP algorithm. We can indeed add zero constraint regret. We can show that the constraint value function for the policy pi k is less than or equal to c bar for all k. And at the same time, we can also show that the regret is, the objective regret is of the order of square root k, which is order optimal, and then square root a and ns. This is approximately optimal in the sense that we know that the lower bound for the unconstrained scenario is of the order of square root s. So we are getting an additional square root term in the upper bound. I want to mention that this, this work is actually an improvement on one of our earlier work from the last year's NeurIPS, where we kind of introduced, uh, we did a little uh, different algorithmic idea to improve the objective regret as well as to get better empirical performance. Okay, so I'm running out of time. So, uh, so I'll just mention, I'll go very quickly on this slide. Just wanted to mention that the DOP algorithm that I just uh, presented, safe exploration algorithm, uh, it gives provable uh, safety guarantee, but the algorithm is restricted to tabular setting. But if you want to scale up this to a large problem, you need to develop arguably a first order algorithm. So the next question that we addressed is, can we develop a scalable safe RL algorithm with provable guarantees? And I would like to point, uh, kind of give this pointer to our recent work on anger changing regularized NPG for multi-objective reinforcement learning. So this work started as a way to solve the constraint MDP using policy gradient algorithm. Then we realized that the framework that we came up, uh, we came up with is useful for a class of algorithm for multi-objective reinforcement learning algorithm. The constraint MDP can be thought as one multi-objective scenario where you want to maximize one objective and constrain the other objective. But if you have multiple value functions, you might want to take a non-linear scalarization. For example, if you want to ensure some kind of fairness, you want to take the log of the uh, log sum of the value function. How do you come up with that? How do you learn the optimal policy in this kind of multi-objective scenario? And we address this in the following talk. So to summarize, um, I presented two class of algorithms, robust reinforcement learning and safe reinforcement learning. And I believe that these are two important topics for the real world deployment of reinforcement learning algorithm. So in the robust algorithm, uh, the simulation to reality gap is one important challenge that we need to overcome using robust RL algorithm. So instead of trying to address this as another heuristic approach, I use the framework of robust MDP and robust reinforcement learning to come up with an algorithm that can probably scale to large state space. In safe reinforcement learning, 
the goal is to develop learning algorithm that can ensure can ensure that constraints are uh, maintained during learning and during deployment so in the first part i proposed an algorithm which is which which i formulated as an exploration versus exploitation trade off while respecting the safety constraint and i also point give a pointer to an algorithm that can scale to large safe space using policy gradient algorithm and we are we are doing like multiple extension and then other interesting looking into multiple other questions related to this another thing that we are currently working on policy gradient algorithm for robust reinforcement learning i'm also very much interested on developing the stochastic approximation algorithm for robust rl like uh, how do we generalize the tt learning algorithm to robust setting q learning algorithm to robust setting with provable guarantees uh, finite time convergence guarantees etc and the third bullet point is something that i'm very fascinated about and then we are actively working on the connection between robustness and meta learning algorithm so the basic idea of simulation to reality gap yeah, is something that some, an important physical challenge that physical real world challenge that we need to solve robustness is one approach to solve that you are just you are being pessimistic we know that the real world is different but you are training a policy that is kind of a pessimistic policy so that it will work in the real world but you may likely to incur some performance cost the meta rl algorithm essentially the goal is to to real world adaptation so that you can adapt to the real world and then improve the performance but it is probably not a uh, it's not a um, arguably working solution to develop an algorithm that can immediately adapt using small number of samples because systems are likely to collapse in that scenario so is there a sweet spot between the robustness as a solution for simulation to reality gap and meta rl algorithm as a solution to simulation to reality gap there is so the the analogy that i am making here is that in the classical control literature there is a lot of interesting work on robust and adaptive control how does it reflect in the robust reinforcement learning scenario or meta reinforcement learning scenario is there something between the robust approach to adaptation or uh, simulation reality gap and meta rl algorithm uh, for the simulation reality gap so that's something that we are uh, interested in and we are working on now so with that i will i will uh, stop the presentation and then take the questions thank you so much dilip for the for the wonderful talk um actually before i open the floor to audience questions i want to mention again that uh, dilip is also available next uh, tuesday uh, from 10 o'clock to 2 p.m if you want to have an in-depth uh, discussion with dilip so you can find the sign up uh, the link to sign up uh, from our announcement uh, email so uh, do we have any questions from the audience uh, feel free to unmute you and uh, directly ask Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, good. Okay. Uh, so I'm a graduate. Uh, my name is Vignesh. I'm a graduate student in aerospace engineering from Purdue. And uh, I'm fairly new to the field of reinforcement learning. So it was definitely very good to learn a lot of new concepts today. And uh, I was wondering about a couple of things you said. Um, so my current research involves simulating a system of systems for um, pretty much simulating the uh, an urban air mobility transport infrastructure, pretty much. So a lot of our work is uh, determining the right level of fidelity for the model. And uh, I proposed using reinforcement learning to sort of uh, find the optimal policy and make sure that uh, the autonomous framework is safe enough. And uh, there is there was quite a bit of resistance uh, regarding the computational complexity of uh, an online R RL algorithm of that scale. So I was wondering if uh, you could talk a little bit more about uh, what the computational complexity of the safe and robust meta RL algorithms that you're working on, what would that look like? And if you foresee um, it being used in an online application. Thank you. Okay, so um, there's multiple parts to the question. So first, uh, let me put this out. Um, I don't believe that like you can train an RL algorithm from scratch in the real world scenario. That will crash because um, any machine learning algorithm requires a large number of data samples. RL is particularly data hungry. That's why you will never see 
uh, any machine learning or any RL algorithm trained from scratch on a real world engineering system. In fact, that is that was the premise of my talk saying that reinforcement learning algorithms are trained on a simulator. And when you take from the simulator to the real world, there is, there is, there is going to be simulation to reality gap. And how do we overcome that simulation to reality gap is one of the main important challenges of the current RL algorithms. Now, so that is my comment about training online. Now, if your question is about offline training of an RL algorithm, say if you want, if you have like a simulator and if you want to use an PPU algorithm for training, then that obviously depends on how big your systems, et cetera. That, so if you are looking for a particular algorithmic architecture, then I'm not sure whether I can help there because uh, for many of the offline training of the standard algorithm, st offline training of RL algorithm, I also rely on some of the state of the art uh, deep RL algorithm. And so I am also limited by their speed. Uh, am I satisfied with their speed? Definitely not because RL algorithm tend to take a lot of samples. Okay? Now, one question, one thing that I observed that obviously, if you have a very large system, like you mentioned, um, again, training as a flat MDP problem is definitely not an uh, uh, not a good solution. Okay? So, you, essentially, you might want to use uh, some idea of like using the known model and then essentially train for the unknown part. Okay? So, essentially, structural decomposition will help. Hierarchical RL will help. Uh, so that essentially depending on specific problem. If you have a very large system, put that into a PPO or TD3 algorithm using a simulator, that is never that is very unlikely to give you a satisfactory solution. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. Um Actually, uh, this is Xiaojun, can I ask? Hi, hi Xiaojun. Yeah, hi. very nice word, very nice word. Um, Thank you. Uh, for the robust part, I um, maybe this is a stupid question. So when you do the Bellman equation type of uh, uh, equation, right, for robust policies, I noticed that at one step, you do the infimum over P, right? I think it's the one that you just showed, maybe. Yeah, this one, this one, the TQ operator. Uh, does it mean that every step you are looking at the worst distribution uh, and then the next step you have to take another worst distribution? So is, I'm wondering, is it too uh, pessimistic? Uh, is it the same as saying that every step there's a wind that uh, make you blow off in the worst way? <laughs> but um, really you the wind is in one direction. Maybe you can you can be robust to any kind of wind that's consistent, but not like changing direction every time. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It makes perfect sense. So okay. if you so the standard. So let's look at this. Okay. Right. So this is essentially means so the Robert Bellman does not really capture the time step. So here it clearly captures the time step. Yes. The solution essentially says are like. Um, you that the, you have a model and then you are indeed right the general formulation assume that you have like the model is changing at each time step okay but the beautiful thing about this particular formulation is that especially if you assume this kind of decomposition it's almost like an independence assumption uh between one time step to another time step intuitively the adversary is selecting a, a model from this set independently in each time step Okay. Mm -hmm. So then we can show that in the infinite horizon setting, the solution of this is actually a stationary model. Oh. So it will turn out that the solution of this maximum problem will be a stationary model. I see. So there's a common model that attain the minimum. Minimum, yes. I see, I see. So then, then, then we need to like then it depend also on like uh, yeah. So whether we feel rush. So then you can also show that like it you can actually uh, get a stationary policy uh, mm -hmm. as the policy optimal policy for this. The, the interesting thing is that like it is if it is instead of the, if you chain uh, anyway. So it's a little more complicated uh, <laughs> mathematical answer for that. I would like to talk to you about that. And then I know that you are interested in this class of problems also. But good thing, uh, very good question. In this formulation, if you assume that 
the adversary is selecting the actions independently at each time adversary is selecting the model independently at each time step then the solution turns out to be a single the optimal strategy for the adversary is to select a single model i see so that that's a little bit surprising to me huh? but but maybe maybe i can talk to you in another occasion Thank you. yeah th thanks and then my, my second question is in your um robust guarantee uh you have to solve this function function optimization problem do you assume that it's it's solvable or it, it's it, there's a part of it saying that it must be solvable because you you, you assume very complex function right it's not a uh, functions so okay so i um so this i have to solve this algorithm so for example i need to solve this problem yeah, yeah. Uh, that i am assuming that i'm able to solve this because uh that's why i kind of put that as a empirical risk minimization so okay. in other word um i did not consider the computational complexity of this optimization problem because i decided to rely on the power of neural networks to solve that problem yeah okay okay great yeah thanks 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 a lot yeah oh uh, hi uh, great uh it's uh i'm gonna say a professor at the me and working on the uh adapt robot control and uh, uh i'm interested in what you're working on here especially some I'd like to get to know some of the videos uh, you have on the uh, applying of your algorithm to the uh, uav landing and and, and there are comparisons with the uh, uh, non your PID. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, we appreciate very much if you can send some of the details that the the paper, whatever. Uh, if you can forward to to the icon I, I, I or to me personally, I would like to take, take a look at it, and then we can have some discussions maybe on Tuesday. Thank you. I, I will definitely send the paper to you uh, immediately after That's this. Mm -hmm. uh, I I want to emphasize that that this work that I showed the practical part is a uh, different from the first part that I showed where I used the RFQ algorithm, mainly because this, this project was started earlier than I started working on the theoretical algorithm. So this is a kind of a more like an applied algorithm. I don't have any theoretical guarantee for this part. But uh, yes, of course, the paper has comparison with the uh, uh, PID control and the nonlinear PID control. Uh, yeah, because I'm, uh, it is essentially just say I have to uh, be interested in how you guys uh, just say. Uh, uh, well, anyway, that's as in terms of details, that's a lot of things to talk about. I think I uh, would like to know the type of uh, space you are, you are, you guys are using, and also the the policy or the control structures you guys are using. Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really interesting. Uh, I I'm a PhD student. Uh, I'm actually looking uh, to study safety guarantees in the context of things like control barrier functions and such. So this is very interesting to see another approach to that. Um, regarding the choosing your safety constraint, um, I don't know if I may have missed it, but could you go into more detail on how you choose that constraint? Like how do you determine whether or not your model is safe with the, the value function? Because uh, I see you've got C uh, bar, uh, but uh, uh, the process of how you would uh, choose that constraint. Uh, so, okay. So the problem setup is that like, uh, uh, my goal is to solve this problem. So uh, the problem parameters given to me are um, R, C, and uh, C bar. So the unknown factor is P. So in our paper, we also assume that R and C are unknown. You can learn that. But C bar is specified as the problem parameter. Okay, so you just so, assume you know the boundaries, uh, whatever that means physically. Correct. That's uh, okay. so in the control barrier function. I am assuming that uh, I know the boundaries, and then I am also making one assumption for in case in case if you misses. Uh, I'm assuming that I'm going to start with a baseline policy, and I know that how much. So how. How what is the performance of that safe baseline policy with respect to that boundary? Okay, so that gives me a little room to explore, and I'm going to make use of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I'm also so I know that I familiar broadly only very broadly familiar with some of the works on control barrier functions, and then uh, 
But if you don't know the boundary that you don't want to violate, uh, then uh, in the learning context, it's probably inevitable that you violate that. Because if, you're, if your signal is you violated or not violated, and if you don't have any other signal, then I'm not sure how do you know before you violating the constraint, right? Sure, yeah. Well, because as to my understanding with reinforcement learning, uh, well, control barrier functions assume that you know a decent amount of the dynamics of, yes. of what's happening in your system versus with reinforcement learning, you don't have those uh, dynamics per se, and you're trying to learn yes. them at the same time. Yes. So the, with the control barrier function, you get that kind of those Lipinoff stability guarantees uh, versus in this case, you're just trying to avoid the boundary while learning the dynamics. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I am Nahid. Uh, I have one more question. Like I am like a PhD student from AE. So I have a question like, how do you select the pessimistic cost uh, the, in your cost function? The, yeah, uh, there, yeah. So, so the intuition, so again, um, in the hindsight, the intuition is pretty straightforward. So essentially let's ask ourselves why, if you are like a reinforcement learning algorithm, which should maintain the constraint, why yeah. is it violating the constraint? The only reason yeah. it's violating the constraint is that your model estimate is incorrect, right? Yeah. So what we are saying is that like, if you know that your model estimate is, um, there is some error in the model estimate. Okay. So let me go back here. Uh, forgive me, like uh, bear with me like uh, one minute. So you have a model estimate P hat. Mm -hmm. And then that is sampled from that is optimate op estimated from some number of samples, right? Mm -hmm. But we can get a statistical uh, an upper bound on the maximum error. Okay. Now I know that if I have if I have the exact model, then I will never violate the constraint because yeah. I can I can project it back. So now if I have some error in the model, then I know that this is the maximum amount of violation that I can make. Okay. What I'm doing is that. I am kind of preemptively kind of accounting for the maximum amount of violation that I can make, put that in the cost function. And then when I solve the constraint optimization problem, I have much more pessimistic constraint. So even if my model estimate is incorrect, since I have a more pessimistic constraint, that estimation error the error due to estimation, sorry, yeah, the, uh, that your uh, error, the by the possible violation due to the model estimation error is still within the uh, safety region. Okay. okay, I got it. Like I, I do have another more question. Like probably I have missed it. Like what, what is the like, what is that H there? Oh, my, oh, I should have emphasized that. Like so here, since it's an online learning problem to model the um, learning while maintaining the safety constraint i consider like a finite horizon cm okay okay got it okay. so thanks. it's not thanks an infinite horizon cmdb okay thanks a lot 